Aloha and welcome to the State of the State of Hawaii on ThinkTech Hawaii, this live streaming network series that occurs every other week. So I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and the Honolulu City and County Mayor's Race is accelerating, as everyone can hardly miss, as we approach the primary on, on August 8th. So by the way, be sure to vote. You should have your your ballot. Today we have one of the mayor's race finalists right here. I'm pleased to introduce Rick Belangiardi, who is in his first race for mayor. So welcome. Uh, Thank you, Stephanie. Your campaign material saying being Honolulu's next mayor is an extraordinary leadership challenge. The arrival of COVID since this campaign began, you will agree has changed the game and uh and it's disturbed any ordinary notions that we may have had so um i wanted to just mention that you bring little experience of public office um uh, holding uh from you for this run for mayor um though you're you are uh recognized uh for your success as a strong leader and in, in business executive roles so but given covid the playing field may be somewhat leveled do you think that's the case um, and how do you feel about being in this situation now and facing the sad losses and brutal effects of this pandemic on Hawaii? Yeah, yeah so how well, I, th I think from the standpoint of what you said uh, with regard to being playing field leveled, uh, that's been true from the standpoint of the challenges of campaigning, if you will. We've all been, you know, cut off from meeting with people or holding fundraisers and anything and everything I imagined that our campaign efforts would be about, which was what we started but when we had one month of it, it was getting out into the districts, meaning people listing and, and doing all of that. So yes, that part has been an equalizer of sorts, if you will. Um, but I think as candidates, we're all very different and we all bring different skill sets, experiences uh, to the job. So uh, in that regard, my perception is that we are who we are as individuals. I think we've all tried to establish um, that in the minds of our voters. And um, you just said something that was very kind and complimentary. Uh, I've been a leader, I've been in leadership roles my whole life in this community, especially outside of my work. And I'm very proud of the body of work, most notably the last 10 years as general manager uh, of, of, of Hawaii News Now and really quite honestly, we took uh, a broken economy in 2008, had a vision, merged our assets, got FCC and DOJ approval, and we built for Hawaii a 21st century multimedia company, of which I hold great pride in uh, because it's an ex exceptional group of men and women there. And we've distinguished ourselves, they have distinguished themselves on the national scene uh, quite admirably. So for me, that's always been a great service to the people. And so that's what I, that's what I bring. I'm really uh, pleased that um, for you that the, the information has been widely distributed. And I think that given um, the strength of your, your executive business experience, um, that that is recognized. Now, I'm, I'm thinking from what you've said that um, in some ways, um, do you think it's been advantageous to come into the campaign without a previous office holding experience? Mm -hmm. I do. I, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, uh, I think the climate is such that, uh, you know, I think people are looking now broader uh, at uh, candidates and, and, and skill sets and individual personalities and uh, whether or not they can trust and believe in them. But it is a leadership job. I said repeatedly, the mayor's, the mayor's job is uh, unique to me in a sense, and that really is the CEO of the city. And it's not about that title, the CEO of the city. It's about the operational aspects of day in and day out and the kinds of people you surround yourself with, the decision-making, the processes, et cetera. And I think a fresh perspective on that uh, is exactly what's needed right now. I was also interested, um, in addition to that, that's, that's very forthcoming, 
uh, I think uh, that you'd mentioned um, in some of the sessions I attended, you were talking about your listening tour, which was uh, to be so important for uh, validator building and validating uh, your views on the ways to serve citizens um, best. So what can you tell us a little bit about what you learned from that and, and but before, was it before COVID? COVID or did that and COVID deeply influence your right, Well, let's, let's up the chronology then straight then just to, for perspective's sake, Steph, um, is that uh, I made this decision a little bit before Christmas. I was all set to spend another year at Hawaii News Now. I was on the contract through 2020. Fortunately, I had the good vision, if you will, a few years ago to hire an incredible young woman um, named Katie Pickman as my, to become my successor. And she was certainly ready and that facilitated my thoughts because I really didn't want to just walk away uh, from not only the body of work over the last 10 years, but my commitment to the men and women who work there. So when we made this decision to do it, I uh, felt very good about Katie's ability to step in. And so I did, I notified the company. I gave them, it was during the holidays, if you will. So January 15th was my last day I retired. And then uh, we announced on February 12th. And we did that at the old stadium park. And at that point, I talked about getting out into all the districts we wanted to hear. But, you know, one month later, March 16th, we got shut down. So what's evolved now is that, candidly speaking, uh, in what I thought were going to be the classic mayoral talking points or concerns, uh, I started first and foremost with homelessness. I've had extensive work in that area. And it was really, quite honestly, maybe single-handedly among the things I looked at, one of the real drivers, but also the uncertainty of rail and all that that brought with it and, and knowing that we were, you know, this was not going to be in 2020, a conversation about rail that we saw in 2012 when Governor Cayetano ran against Mayor Caldwell and where rail was eight years ago and where rail is today. So that was going to be a whole different scenario, if you will, uh, about rail and, and what all that means. And as we just saw just last week, uh, Andy Robbins announced that they received two of the P3 bids and they're going to evaluate those. And I think somewhere in the latter part of August, we're going to, it'll be disclosed as to whether or not one of them is a winning bid. Uh, that said, rail, but I was looking at other issues too, from a mayor standpoint of somebody who's lived here for 55 years and loved this place with respect to infrastructure, elder care. Clearly last fall, if you remember, and I was just on a phone call yesterday with Chief Susan Ballard uh, talking about where we are with crime. But in the fall last this past fall, from the lens of my newsroom, we were doing shootings. It's just unprecedented amount of shootings and crime and old people getting knocked down in parking lots and their purses being stolen and a lot of stuff that was going on. So, you know, clearly uh, crime safety, if you will, were these issues. I thought all of that would be really classic and important talking points for the well-being and the fabric of our city. And COVID-19, as you've said already, kind of came in, disrupted everything, um, has preempted everything. It's really amplified, quite honestly, those other situations. But the reality is we're now talking about rebuilding our state's economy, our city's economy, about you know trying to keep people from losing roofs over their head in an unprecedented way, uh, people who are going to lose work and lose work permanently and all the ramifications of that, uh, you know, just unprecedented um, situations. So this idea of what we're going to do with, you know, this whole place, Hawaii is populated, 95% of the businesses that register DBED employ 20 or fewer people. We are a land of entrepreneurs, service oriented, no big corporate headquarters, no big, you know, um, so you know, so how we're going to do what we're going to do to keep our small businesses open. What are we going to do to keep people who are in need of food or need of shelter? I mean, this crisis, in, in the perspective, Stephanie, is that five months ago, pretty much, is when we announced. If I think back on how much has just happened in five months, these past five months, for all of us, anybody listening to it, this has been unprecedented. It's been all used so many times. Absolutely. Unimaginable, almost even, right? This kind of, and Look, we're still, and we're still five months out from getting in the job. Yes. I've never been, as a business person, I've never been five months in front of a job. And so it's very difficult, if not impossible, to predict what it will be like on January 2nd, if we're fortunate enough to earn the, earn the people's confidence and get elected. 
That said, I do know, though, we will be tethered to the virus, this epidemic, this pandemic, okay? And, um, and so in that regard, you know, I think it's going to be more crisis management with respect to saving businesses, helping those businesses navigate through, get whatever federal monies and all monies, whatever we can do to help people with protocols, and then the ongoing aftermath of, of really having to navigate through, I think, going to be federal subsidies for some time. Yeah. So I can go on and on about that, but that's a very different deal. Well, we got, I mean, your points are, are certainly right on point. All of us are concerned about those, and it's good that you remind us of their uh, importance and priority for you. I know that with those budget issues that are coming up and the shutdown of the economy and your interesting data on, on the small business uh, community here in Hawaii, which is so precious and so vulnerable. But um, you had said something in your, in your materials about you were very experienced with working turnaround and uh, working turnaround challenges. So I, I thought, right. Very interesting label for a set of skills or understandings about how all this works. So can you give us a few examples? Okay, well, let, let's be clear on the semantics of first. You know, and historically, I have been the guy who was always hired, and I could give you multiple settings. My resume is out there. There, there was hired to replace the person they fired, and they said, fix it. <laughs> that was even true when I came back to Hawaii 18 years ago. I was running a company called Telemundo. As a president of it, we sold it to NBC. That was a major turnaround. It was highly regarded in the national scene. Um, and what we did, I was the president of the company. We rebuilt that company uh, and then sold it, came home, took over KH1 and KGMB simultaneously. But that's germane to broadcast, and that's the work that I have done in that context, in that I've been a turnaround. This is, this is not a turnaround situation. This is a rebuild. That's why I said on the semantics, because the impact of this is so incredible. And, but at the same time, there are a lot of things I think that one does. Um, probably first and foremost, if I can say this, I have no delusions at all about being, you know, the, uh, the puppet master here. One person, it's all about me, what comes out of my brain, my mouth. I really plan on surrounding myself as I have done historically with a really talented group of people. And I believe firsthand, and uh, that there are uh, really lots of talented people, both currently working in city government, but other people that I hope to be able to bring in uh, in the key selection positions we get to make that will, you know, help run the city. It's going to take a team of people. I was, uh, what I'm asking for in getting elected here and running for office is to be trusted with the responsibility for the city. But make no mistake about it, it's going to take a lot of men and women to run this city. And that's really how I like to operate. That's a leadership style that's an attitude that's outside of the political arena. A very important uh, uh, mark or characteristic then of, of how it is that you're going to go about these, uh, as you say, extraordinary and daunting challenges. So um, I know that, you know, with heart, you've said some things already uh, with the rail. Um, I, I know that you've said that you want them to be, you want to make them fully accountable. Uh, and as you say, you're looking over the documentation that's coming in to be able to fund this uh, enormous project and, and also just to have them stop wasting money. So now those are some pretty tough goals uh, and that would they would any work on those would be most welcome so how how is it that you see that? <laughs> yeah well, okay look all right so so the rail is a big topic okay no question it's a huge topic and as i said covid's amplified it and we've been waiting for this p3 now almost a year so here's the perspective i'd like to offer to anybody viewing is that pre-covid i was uh in favor of the rail project for a lot of reasons as just part of the, uh, the, the vision and fabric of our city from the standpoint of what everything was sold and, and represented in this, in this project and in, in the linkage, if you will, from Honolulu, actually originally was the university, to West Oahu, the building of the second city, et cetera, all of that. Um, and you know, I, I had actually done editorial, so I don't want to be disingenuous about our need to finish the project. I have since then become the contrarian in COVID at least among the other candidates, because I don't look at it that way anymore. I mean, first of all, there's a couple of things that need to be said. And again, this is being just grounded in reality, um, is that you have a project that is um, years delayed, billions of dollars over budget and under federal investigation, um, and, and for corruption and other things that are not uh, very complimentary. 
Now, some people have a notion of thinking that, that the rail uh, P3 is going to be the panacea, if you will, that's going to come in. And, but I, I'm skeptical about that. If you take a look at where we are in the project, they built the easiest part of the project, albeit 15 miles uh, first, and it's more than double the budget. Okay. And the P3 has been put out at 1.4 billion for the last uh, 4.1 miles of the city center segment, which will involve coming down the Dillingham corridor and a lot of other things that I don't think um, is going to be an on budget situation. And although I don't have the analysis of that, just realistically and looking at how monies have been spent and what I just simply said in the math and how this seems feasible, especially knowing how difficult it is to construct a bridge, a 4.1 mile bridge through the downtown corridor and all that will come with that. Now I do believe, which is a separate project in the rail budget, that all the utilities to be done and that Dillingham corridor need to be put in place because I do think we can. There's been much said about transit-oriented development. I think we do a lot of development even without the rail. But let's take a look at the macro scene right now. The public transit on the national level is in a debt spiral, okay? It's accumulating in 36 of the major cities. Just think of New York. Everybody maybe has been to New York, the subway systems, whatever. 90% of the people are not riding. The debt that's accumulating is right now in the many, many billions of dollars, and it's only going to become more aggravated and more so for the government to, to create bailout. And we're, look, we keep thinking whether it's going to be $1 trillion or $3 trillion, or what's being argued about as we speak today. Those are, those are big numbers, but we're talking about massive bailouts. I don't think the environment is conducive for us to go back and get more money for the feds from this. So well, as I... Rick, I the last time, are you saying... Ahead. That, that ridership is down. I mean, uh, I'm familiar with Washington, D.C. I know it's down there, 95%. But are you talking about oh, yeah. the COVID? Or are you talking talk about No, COVID has, COVID has brought public conveyance, if you will, to a standstill. Nobody's doing that. And, and the, in the, if you just take the top 30, just the top 36 cities, Washington, D.C. being one, I mean, they have these really extensive uh, transportation systems, which actually was probably the reason why I was in favor of the rail before, because we lacked that. I mean, I, I go back to Hawaii when we had the hydrofoil and literally cried when we lost the super ferry. I mean, you know, we but, need to be in the tweet. And it was so late when the discussion came up because the city is of that rectangular flat shape that, um, and the second city and on out, that it's perfect actually for, for rapid transit. However, I mean, by the time we got to right. it. Right, but, but in this circumstance, all things being equal, I was going to say, going back to where we're going to have, first of all, no tourists for a long time. We're going to have them coming back slowly, recalibrating tourists. The construction of the rail is tied to the GET and the TAT. Those numbers are going to be greatly diminished and they have a compound effect over the next several years while we get back to whatever that number is going to be. But we're not going to get back to 10 and a half million anytime soon or the $2 billion we had in tax revenue in 2019. We're not going to see that for some time. You suggest okay. that this might need to stop? Right, yes. So, yes. So, you, you have a situation with that. And now you have a situation where when I announced in February, we had one of the lowest unemployments in the country. Okay. Now we are going to have one of the highest unemployments and soon to be even more and more thousands of people are going to be laid off because hotels are not going to open up until January. You're going to start to see these announcements. What were temporary layoffs and furloughs are going to become permanent layoffs with ramifications on health care and other kinds of things. And, you know, and as the P3 monies run out and P3 monies, rather the PPP monies run out, you know, there's, a, there's an effect here where you're going to have a disruption just in sales tax, as it is now. Retailers are hurting. People are, you've got to be practical. So I learned a long time ago, since you cited my business background, I, this is a CEO to CEO kind of thing you learned. If the numbers don't make sense, the strategy doesn't make sense. Saying we're going to force it by sharpening our pencils or believing naively we can go to Washington to get more money, should it go over, is not going to happen. And I've made it clear from the get-go. Now I for all the other candidates say they won't raise property taxes, but this is not anywhere near a climate in which you want to do that. And in fact, quite honestly, right now we're operating on the supposition people will be able to pay their property taxes. What happens if we start getting defaults there, which is the lifeblood of the city's revenue? Well, this is nope. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this, and of course, I'm, what I'm hearing is what you're saying in your literature and, and in your speeches, and I know that this, the city county has now blo blocked out a payment plan for everybody, so we've all got yes. to 
that envelopes with we can make four payments or something instead of having yes. to pay off at one point. And that, that was a smart move. That, that, that was appreciated. I mean, certainly by me, presumably that, by me. Oh, no, that was, I've seen those envelopes. That's a smart move, yes. So now that we're, um, We've covered these these subjects like rail. I want to ask you about something harder, and that has to do ah. with <laughs> the comments um, I've read uh, lately um, and the news about um, well, your Shopo uh, support is is quite uh, an achievement, and uh, certainly feedback uh, for some quality considerations they have for the work of the mayor that you they believe you can do. So, but however, but along with that has come concern. Um, about your spouse's affiliation with Shopo um, over the years. And so I wanted to know how, how you can assure the voters about the situation, especially uh, given your recent support from, from the group that your family was associated with. Yeah, okay, well, my wife you're talking about. Um, the day we made this decision in December is the day she called Mayor Caldwell and Susan Ballard and re resigned from the police commission. Okay, she served on that for two years. Quite honestly, she did it for all the right reasons. I was somewhat against her doing it, um, knowing full well the challenges there, because you know Hawaii News now is very involved in the whole Kailoa thing. I just thought you're going to take on a lot of work. She did. She loved it, but she 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 left uh, the police department. My getting the endorsement for Shopo had nothing to do with Karen's tenure on um, on on the, on the police commission. I fact, quite honestly. I was surprised I did get Shopo's endorsement because we had been uh, reporting a lot of stories about our police. We had been fighting. I had been, I had arguments about with Louis K. Lowe when he was chief about transparency and so on and so forth. So, you know, it really had a lot to do with my personal integrity and who I was in my sense of understanding how fundamentally important it is for people to feel safe. Now, I got that endorsement again. Karen left the police department. She, we, we announced on February 12th. Caldwell, Mayor Caldwell had her finish up at the end of January, but she announced her just the same day I said to her, we're going to, we agree we're going to do this. So there's no involvement there. And um, so let me just assure anybody that would even be concerned about that, which I think is, when I think about Karen's hard work, it's almost ludicrous because she really did that. My wife was also chair of Hawaii Pacific Health for six years, was on the board for nine years and had a lot to do with the, that hospital. And you call Ray Vard, a CEO, he would tell you that. In addition to that, when she retired and we got together, she was president of Charles Schwab nationally. She was one of the highest ranking female executives in the United States. My wife is nothing but um, capable, honest, highest levels of integrity. Uh, and so I don't even know how that could even get confused, except I'm very fortunate to have a spouse, Karen, who was born in Beijing, who was extremely accomplished in corporate America, a great thought partner, and very supportive of my doing this. So. I want to say that on behalf of my own wife, but the Shopo endorsement was wonderful. It was short-lived in the context that we no sooner got that. I felt so proud and so surprised to get that support. And then the George Floyd incident happened and suddenly everything blew up about police and defunding the police. And it's going on to this very day. And we're all watching, we're all watching simultaneous with this incredible health crisis, okay, and economic crisis. We're watching video from the mainland that's really hard for me to believe. You know, I used to live in Seattle for several years. I, I know the neighborhoods. I can't even believe that's going on up there, as one example. Well, this is, uh, yeah, and, and so it, it is nice to have some deflection from these kinds of topics, but it looks like you're, you're uh, putting forth some information that uh, people need to hear uh, in order to feel assured and confident about um, that, that, that sort of thing. And um, it's very, uh, it's interesting to hear of the accomplishments of your spouse and uh, between the two of you, you've been quite successful. And let's hope that the, the, uh, the comments made on this show are informative for voters to understand what the, the, the affiliation was all about. I'm, 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 I'm very proud of Karen. They cried when she left Hawaii Pacific Health and they certainly, Caldwell actually called me up and said, she doesn't, you can run for office, she doesn't have to leave. And I said, no, she does. We're not going to get compromised for the very reason that you just asked me. And that's what we uh, need to, to understand that you're thinking in that matter, because we are very concerned about corruption uh, in general and in the nation and certainly here in Hawaii, too, and trying to turn around from any of those kinds of miscreances that people, unfortunately, are sometimes tempted by and subject to. But I wanted to ask you, um, 
if you would share, uh, if you would be willing to just project to the end of your mayoral term. You're already there, you've done, you've been through it, yeah. lived through it, and, uh, and now you're looking to uh, go on to, ha uh, to, to uh, vacation. To die, probably, that'll be it. That'll be my last chapter, Stephanie, come on. This is, you uh -huh. know, I've no pretense about it. I'm 73 years old, I feel as good as I did when I was 50. I'll be 74 in office. Let's be realistic here. So whether it's four years of God willing, eight years, I feel pretty good. I was on the phone last night with a woman who told me she was having a birthday tomorrow. It's surprise anything. I said, how old are you going to be? 60? And she said, I'll be 80. Look, we're in a different place right now. So I, I told her, I said, Barbara, and it was Barbara, I love you. So but, here's the deal. I, I would tell you, and this is aspirational, if you will, but I think leaders are aspirational. And we certainly know that um, going into office at this time will be unprecedented for anybody because a set of circumstances is anything but business as usual. So if I were to talk to you conceptually as a leader on a vision that I hold dear to my heart since you asked me, right now, fear and uncertainty is growing by the day, okay? And I know for a fact, as you just alluded to, there's trust issues abound, if you will, uh, with respect to elected leaders. So I would tell you that if starting out, we can create hope in people through our actions and build trust in the beginning and the things that we're doing. That if when, I, when all is said and done, if we can instill hope in a people who will be fearful and uncertain, if we can do that, and by the time I leave office, we, I leave a confident people, everything in between, the journey of all of that, the decisions, the things that will happen, because I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, look at what we're living in right now. You couldn't have predicted this eight months ago. You know, if we can go from instilling hope to confidence, everything, everything in this next chapter will have been worth it. That's how I see my tenure since you asked me that question. Okay, I think um, I had also had in mind asking you for some outcomes or an outcome. Do you have, and I understand this is aspirational, and I understand all of the impediments no. you, and that surprises, surprises. Uh, so, but as an outcome for your mayorship, what might you see? Okay, I think first of all, we're gonna take a big bite out of homelessness. I mean, homelessness has been kicked around for a long time. We've been really involved with that, and I could talk about that all day. It's a multi, multifaceted, complex issue, but we have to do something about our chronic homeless. It's become, it's become very, um, well, just like tourism. You know, tourism used to be pretty much centered in three places, Waikiki, then not too long ago, Kapolei, but Turtle Bay's been out there for a long time. Now, because of 14,000 illegal vacation rentals, it's in everybody's neighborhood. Well, it's the same thing that's happened with homelessness. You know, it was confined in some areas, and, but now it's become very disjointed. People are seeing things in their own neighborhoods that are very threatening, very upsetting, et cetera. We need to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. Very homelessness, good. a big bite out of homelessness. Clearly, I'm a really big believer we can do a lot with affordable rental units in the city corridor from Kaimuki through Kalihi and a few other places. There are more than Marshall Hung is one of the most brilliant men I've ever talked about. There's already Ordinance 19.8. Senate Bill 7 that's been already out there that really, uh, they've never really incentivized developers to build the kinds of buildings that I, I lived in when I went to grad school at UH in 1973. Those kinds of, we need affordable rental units that people who are making ordinary incomes, you know, can afford. We already know about one out of two people. So affordable rental units. Yes. And is the best. Exactly. You know, against an AMI that they can afford that. The other development projects are already on the books. Yeah, and they are very informative, and those are hopeful outcomes, and that's something um, I see you've got your finger on, and I like the bite, getting that bite out of, if not more, eat them all up, clean the plate, but for homelessness. So um, it's aloha time, so we're out of time. And, um, Too fast. <laughs> I know we need more done. I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This is the state of the state of Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii live streaming network ser series. So we've been talking remotely with Rick Blangiardi, uh, mayoral finalist for Honolulu City County. And I'll see you again in two weeks on the state of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo, Rick, and mahalo all of you for your attention. Aloha. Thank you, Stephanie. Aloha.